Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Connections with myself, Cameron Bunch, and my father, Dr. Randy Lane Bunch. Last week, we talked about the sound of freedom and just talking about, in general, the courage that we need to have in this generation to stand up against evil. Because as we know, if you don't say something, then you're still acting. Being silent is a decision. I mean, there are so many protests where people just sit in silence or starve themselves. So doing nothing is still a protest. Doing some, nothing still is picking a side. And so that we need in this day and age to be salt and light to our dying world. And we talked about Sound of Freedom, talking about the sex trafficking that's happening with children, the abuse that happens there, and the movie of how Tim Ballard uh, decided to make a action to leave his job behind and pursue uh liberating children in the private sector because he was uh, pretty much handcuffed when he was uh, with the government because unless a perpetrator was an American citizen, he couldn't do anything. So if you want to hear all about that, please check out last week. Um, we're taking kind of a massive shift as we often do. Um, since last week we talked about was kind of more of a heavy and very serious tone. We're going to something more uh, light, but still uh, very foundational. And in fact, we're calling this Foundations of Faith. And the reason this kind of came up is, uh, as you guys know, my dad and I, um, we try to address issues as they come up in the world. Sometimes it's in our personal lives, sometimes it's in popular, or sometimes it's questions we're asked. And uh, today we were kind of discussing before we met, what did we want to talk about? And how I ended up bringing up that a recurring theme that has been the last couple of weeks for me has been on the topic of trust. And what I mean about this is, um, to start off, I was having some financial things that, uh, for those of you who don't know or haven't guessed by now, I'm a hyper analytical person. I will plan and rethink and try to arrange things in the best way, and then I'll learn more and I'll rearrange them. And um, I think that we should always be learning and growing, and we should be able to analyze and make wise decisions. I believe God gave us a brain for a reason, and we're meant to use it. He gave us the ability to acquire wisdom and seek it out. I mean, that's what Proverbs is about, seeking out true wisdom. Um, and so I get hyper-analytical, and I started getting this way and started getting almost nervous. And it was just kind of a moment of God being like, do you not trust me? And it was kind of a, after all this time, do you not trust me? Like, go back to the foundations, go back to what you first knew. And I was like, it's, it's very fair, God. And then on Sunday, I was doing ministry time at my church, which is where we just go up a uh, different minister every week. We'll go up and just after worship, exhort on whatever the Lord puts on their heart. And it's very intentional that we never prepare anything because it allows God to move as he would like. And so during worship, I just felt like God was like, I want you to share what I said to you. And no sooner than that, the last song starts playing and it's literally all about trust. And I started laughing just because of God's timing of things. Because if that song had played first, I'd been like, nah, that was just me picking it because it was about trust. And so it was just, again, encouraging people to go back to the foundations because, uh, and even our pastor mentioned it in the sermon that one time he was discussing with an individual that was going through a rough time and they were like, well, what should I do? And he's like, well, you need to trust God. And they're like, well, that's a pat answer. And he's like, it's not a pat answer. It's a real answer because reality is so time, sometimes life just gets so overwhelming and we get bogged down and we want this complex answer. But the reality is we need to trust in God. And this thing just kept coming with throughout the weeks of Jody and I were talking about, um, cause she's studying the book of Genesis right now and just doing more of a dive into that and looking and analyzing different parts. And we were talking about the old Testament covenants, how it had uh, Noah, and then Abraham, and then Israel, and then with David, and you have four Old Testament covenants, and God keeps these, and he proves himself trustworthy with the fulfillment of Jesus. And then we go on, and we were talking about how we had a sick friend, and they were telling me that their family had said that we should prepare for like a funeral maybe in the next year or so, and it was kind of a question, I'm like, is this person saved? And she's like, yeah, and I'm like, have they resigned to like not praying for healing or so it was, again, an issue of like, do we trust in God in this moment or have they resigned? And then the last one, I know I'm kind of rambling, but trying to give you foundation of where this all came from was I I am someone that for, if you've watched this uh, podcast, you'll realize that I watch YouTube a lot. I watch a lot of streamers. And one of the main reasons why is I like staying very current with our culture. I think once I get out of touch as, or people in general get out of touch with modern culture, you lose the ability to speak into it. Um, 
And oftentimes when Jody and I hang out with like younger kids, whether it's because she's a teacher or because her uh, brother's a bit younger and his friends are over, whenever they're around, they know that they can talk to me about anything going on kind of right now in culture, whether it's television or games, and that I'm going to connect. And it's because I make a very intentional effort to stay connected. And I was listening to a group of streamers that I enjoy, and they were talking about how they kind of walked away from their faith. And it was kind of a, did they not trust God to pursue the information, to pursue like looking into the science and information? Um, and I haven't got a chance to listen to their podcast in full, so I can't make full comments on everything about it. But one of the comments I heard them say was they'd read a book and it convinced them. And I'm like, you read one book, you read one book and that convinced, like, did you not try to read any like antithesis arguments? Did you not try to pursue it yourself? And so it was a matter of, all these things, just a waterfall of where is the trust in God? Where is the giving him the benefit of the doubt if he's proven himself faithful for so long? So with all of that thrown at you in the beginning of the foundation, let's jump into the foundations of faith. Yeah, you made a great comment there about, you know, did you even listen to a counter argument? And there is a an apologist, Frank Turek, whose ministry is called Cross-Examined. And it comes from that verse, which says in the book of Proverbs, every man sounds right until his neighbor speaks, or a more modern translation says, until the cross-examination. I think we've all been susceptible to this. Pastors have experienced this. They're listening to a husband or wife complain in their office, and you begin to, you know, kind of side in with their arguments. You know, yeah, your spouse, that good for nothing. Why didn't he ever help you around the house, blah, 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 or vice versa. And then the spouse comes in and gives their side of it, and pretty soon you're feeling more empathy for them. And you're thinking, well, you're the jerk, you know? And and the fact of the matter is, is if we just hear one side of the argument, um, anybody sounds right, you know? And th and so I think that's a great launching pad, Cameron, for where we're going. And as you said, your, your issues are kind of like for someone that's already down the line a bit. You're talking about trusting God as a believer for provision or for, in the case of that relative of Jody's healing, but someone who is outside the faith looking in, the very first question that they're going to ask is, well, I mean, if they're you know intellectually curious and really honest, what is the foundation of your faith to begin with? Why do you even believe what you believe? I mean, let's let's admit it. We Christians believe something pretty incredible things. We believe there was a man that was swallowed by a great fish and lived to tell the tale. We believe in someone who was crucified on a cross 2,000 years ago and was raised from the dead three days later and instigated the church, which we now know and love. And so there ought to be a pretty sustainable foundation for that, right? If if that is what we're going to bank our eternal existence and life on. And, you know, even though a lot of people would argue with this, it is unarguable. In fact, there was even a university study done. I can't remember now which university. It's been so long. You know, you study different things and you move on. So I forget the details, but there's university study done about, you know, what were the documents that most influenced our Constitution? The Bible was number one. And and obviously, even the, the branches of government to, to provide accountability among them came from the idea of man being a fallen being. And that, that you know, like the old statement of Lord, Lord Acton, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. And because we're sinful people, we need checks and balances. And so the Bible serves as a foundation for our justice system. It's based on the Judeo-Christian ethic you know, the Ten Commandments and the other laws of the Bible. And of course, we understand some of those were ceremonial things that passed away, no longer have relevance, but the moral law is still with us today. And it's somewhat, some call natural law, that which is obvious to all of us. And so, I mean, the Bible is deeply rooted, and our culture, I should say, is deeply rooted in to the scriptures. So if that is true, then we ought to be able to answer for why we believe that the Bible serves as a good foundation for life, for justice, for society, for anything. And so we thought, Cameron, you know, maybe a good place to start would be talking, you know, about the Bible itself, and is it reliable? And, um, you know, that's something you and I have talked about. That's something I've taught as a teacher on biblical apologetics, but I don't think this is something that is, I don't know, even honestly thought about by much of the opposition, if you want to put it that way. You, Like you said, a lot of people are listening to one side of the argument, particularly I think that's true don't you think in like in popular culture oh absolutely I think that especially when it comes to I mean I went to a university that was a very secular university 
And the moment you walk through the doors, the the narrative you are being told is not one of faith. I've had three separate professors in three different departments mock people for believing in God. My political science class, my first one, the professor was like, none of you are still stupid enough to believe in God, right? Like, none of us are still stupid enough to believe in that. I raised my hand. I'm like, I still believe in God. Like, I don't care that it was a, like, backhanded question. I was still going to raise my hand. I had a, um, a religion professor that made the same comment of, like, in a creation versus evolution class, I was very interested in the title. And he's like, I'm not really sure why we still have this class. Like, no one still, like, believes in creationism, right? Like... And I think like when listening to that class, I wouldn't have said a this or that because as you and I probably would uh, talk about in maybe another conversation that we don't think that God can't use evolution through certain means. We obviously don't believe every sense of evolution. We don't believe that man evolved from like a single cell organism. We believe that God inspired and created man, but we definitely believe he used evolutionary processes and that he is an intelligent God and he can create the world in ever, whichever way he fashions since he's yeah. fit. Um, but the professor was like, none of you still believe in creation or God or anything. Right. And again, I'm the one raising my hand and the same thing happened in a history class of just like a history teacher calling out. So it's very quick that there's a very uh, firm narrative in a secular school, especially, uh, in modern culture. And it is not one that, um, espouses that the Bible is historically accurate. Um, it is that the Bible teaches principles that it finds moral through uh, myths and fables, much like the Greeks did, much like the Romans did. And um, it is not a matter of this is fact or reliable. It is this is a story and you're supposed to get the moral message from it. Right. And by the way, just to clarify for those that are hearing this, there's different um, types of or, or images or ideas of evolution. One of them is what we call evolution from common descent. That's what we reject, that we came from a single cell organism. We don't believe we came from monkeys. What we do believe is that God made creatures with the capacity to adapt, like the, mm -hmm. um, the uh, Galapagos finches or like sheep that get more wool when it, they're in a cold environment. And so that idea of adaptation has been extrapolated to come up with or to you know be the foundation of imagination for macro evolution which we do not believe in we don't believe that you know that fish you know pop out with legs and become mammals and so forth and so on but we do believe in adaptability which most even believing scientists would believe in that i think most all of us understand that that is true that's why we have a lot of different dog breeds because we can crossbreed and get different um kinds of dogs depending on how they're bred and so forth so long story short just to clarify that in case anybody Thanks, Cameron. And I believe we swing through the jungle years ago. We don't, we don't believe that. So anyway, not, it's not through from what, from the goo through the zoo to you. We don't believe in that. So anyway, um, but yeah, so we were talking about this idea that if we're going to start this discussion on the foundations of faith, it would be good to go back to the ultimate foundation of our faith, which is the scriptures, the word of God, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you're going to have faith in a resurrected Christ, that faith is ultimately going to come from the scripture. Um, and you, will you say, well, I, I believe it on the basis of historical realities. Well, there's, there's some good historical validation for the accounts of the resurrection as well, but most of those are found in the scripture, right? So when it comes to our faith, it is rooted in the Bible in the Holy scriptures. And, you know, you think about the Bible camera, just, just in the makeup of the Bible, this may, you know, if we break this down, this may take a little bit of time because it's worth, I think, investing the time to talk about just how miraculous the scriptures themselves are. 66 books, 27 in the New Testament, 39 in the Old. And out of those books, 40 different authors, over 1,500 years of authorship um, by a completely disparate group of people, kings, paupers, shepherds, you know, it runs the gambit, right? And yet there is a unity and a uniformity in the story, the narrative, the arc of the Bible that is unmistakable from the opening of Genesis, which right within the few chapters, you have your first prophecy of the Messiah, all the way to the book of Revelation, which is a revelation of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You have this amazing meta-narrative that is a revelation of the person of Jesus Christ 
from creation to fall to was it creation fall um i'm forgetting the three i think it's creation fall redemption and restoration so anyway all this this huge meta narrative as we call it sometimes and the scriptures give testimony to that and there are some fantastic fantastic things in the scriptures no doubt about it but we believe that the bible is true now when we say we believe the bible is true i think we have to qualify what we mean by that because sometimes you know for example, there are a lot of rhetorical devices, metaphor, simile, just like we use in any other form of literature, right? So when we say we take the Bible literally, somebody might say, well, you believe God's a chicken because the Bible said, under his feathers you will trust. No, we don't believe God is a bird. Obviously, there are rhetorical devices. There are different, um, you know, uh, uh, again, metaphors, similes that the scriptures use, particularly in poetic language or in some of the, even the poetry in Genesis 1 through 3. There are some things written in a specific way to achieve a certain end. If, for example, it's not a science book, Genesis, right? So we, we have to understand how the Bible was written, who, who it was written by, and to whom it was written. So all these things are important. So when we say we believe the Bible, what we mean is we believe the Bible is inspired and that it's reliable and that it is true, meaning that we believe that it carries the message of redemption um, faithfully and that what it says can be relied upon, that it serves as a foundation for faith. And I guess, Cameron, this would be a good place to read the scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. I think it was Chuck Misler who used to say, rather than say we take the Bible literally, because that's a dangerous thing to say, it's better to say we, we take the Bible seriously. Because again, there are places where it's obviously not meant to be taken literally because it's using a metaphor or a simile. But the truth that is communicated through those metaphors, similes, and rhetorical devices is absolutely true and reliable. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, when you look at the Bible, you also have to recognize that what is being written can't mean anything other than what the native audience hearing it would have understood. That's right. And I think oftentimes we have the... Um, practice of superimposing ourselves into the story and seeing it through our eyes instead of what a um, ancient Israelite would have understood it to mean. And yeah. I mean, I think it's very American of us to do so. I mean, we always <laughs> bring things to, well, this is how yeah. I feel about it. This is how I view it. And a lot right. of times, I mean, that's how we're raised in school. Like, what do you interpret it to mean? But oftentimes we shouldn't be saying, what do you interpret it to mean? Is what was the author intending to mean? Um, and one of uh, the groups that I love listening to is uh, the Bible Project with uh, Tim and John, and yeah. they do an amazing job at a lot of things. And one of the things that they uh, talk about often is trying to get their audience to understand what the um, ancient Israelite would have been viewing it as and understanding it as. And take, for example, you use the book of Genesis. You look at the opening of Genesis, and it talks about God creating the world in seven days. But one of the things that's being accomplished there, again, like you mentioned, it's not a scientific textbook, but what is being relayed is a historical account. So yes, the author is meaning to say that God did all these things, but he doesn't mean to lay it out in a scientific way, but in a literary way that is beautiful and well, like, well crafted to how an Israelite would take interest and understand it. So when he's talking about God created the sun, well, the Israelites just came out of a bunch of polytheistic religions, one of which was from Egypt, where they believed the sun god was Ra, and he was a god. But instead, Moses is saying, in the beginning, God created the sun. And so God rules over the sun. The sun isn't a god itself. It's a creation by which God made for his people to enjoy because it was good for them. Right. And so right there, you see that Moses is using creative and literary devices devices to undermine all these false religions that they've been learning about in captivity and reinstating that Yahweh is the true God. He is the creator, which is why in the beginning it's talking about Elohim, 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 the creator. And that's one of the titles for God is that he's a creator. And that's one of the meanings of Elohim. There's many others. We're not going to get into that. Um, but then you see it throughout even the New Testament. A lot of people are like, well, one writer said there's one man. The other said there's two. Well, in that time period, it wasn't inaccurate for a person to have, one, differences in how they viewed an account, because one, 
when you look at us every day and a police goes to investigate people, how many witnesses were there? How many uh, perpetrators were there? They'll give many different answers. So some people just view it differently. But also, I don't even necessarily think that that's what's required of the authors at that time. In historical accounts at that time, you could be creative and literarily intelligent and narrating a point that you're trying to communicate. So if they're maybe putting two people because they want this idea of dualism to go through out their book, they can do that as long as the historical like events are still right. actual events. Yeah. And so that's what you see happening is often the Luke, for example, you see this beautiful narrative journey that spirals back into uh, Jerusalem to the end of Jesus' ministry. And it's beautifully well crafted. And in like Luke, you see a lot of the healings and the physician side that represents Luke. And in Matthew, you see a lot of narrative talking about the Jews and focus and emphasis on the Jews. And so all, all these gospels are telling beautiful stories to the audience to which they were written. And they're okay. They don't have to be word for word identical to be historically accurate in that sense. But because we have a different way as Americans of notating history we want to superimpose our judgments on it and say, well, it's, it's not how history should be done. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned the Gospels, because they're probably one of the best examples of this. It's what we call biblical narrative. And the purpose of the writer was not to change the facts of history, but to use certain facts, maybe exclude some and include others, not because he's trying to change the narrative or be unfactual, but he would only tell those facts that were necessary to achieving the end goal of the narrative. So if he was like, for example, we look, we know the Gospels each had a purpose. Matthew was to show Jesus as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. That's why you'll constantly run into that it may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And then in Mark, you can see it's a fast Gospel. Everything's immediately Jesus did this. Forthwith, he came out and did this. And the whole idea is that it's like an action movie. It's written for the Romans. It's written for the Gentile, for the people that just want to see what Jesus is doing. He's the workhorse, if you will, the ox if you will, of the of, of the scripture. And then Luke, he's the perfect man. And as you said, there's a lot of things that exemplify Jesus as that. Then John shows the divine side. And so there are certain things that each author picks out of the life of Jesus to emphasize what he's trying to get across. It's not that he's making anything up. They're not. They're only telling those factual incidents, in, instances, however, that, that play into the narrative that they're trying to paint. So that's why for example, in the healing of the blind men, sometimes, now I'm not talking necessarily about Bartimaeus, um, but there was one, for example, place where it talks about blind men following Jesus, and they follow into a house, and he says, do you believe I'm able to do this? And they say yes. And sometimes you'll see one blind man, sometimes you'll see two. Um, and other, for, and a great example, of course, is the resurrection. Um, all, all the narratives are a little bit different. Were there one angel? Were there three angels? And the author is only simply bringing out those parts that are necessary to get across what he's trying to convey. And like you said, it's like somebody watching an accident. Somebody sees this tail, detail, somebody sees a little extra here, but misses this over here. You put them all together, you have a compilation of the truth. And people have used this style of writing, which was perfectly accepted in first century. That's how they did it. And, and because, like you said, we do things different. We want it like a police report where everything is included, no detail left unturned, or something like a scientific experiment, where all the data is there, they don't, they don't do that. And it wasn't expected of them to do that. It would have been weird to them to do that. So they're not, they're not taking anything away from the historical facts. It's that they're only recording those historical facts that relate to the end goal of their particular narrative. And so that, I think that's helpful for people to understand. So that, for example, if you're an unbeliever and you're going through the Bible for the first time, and you're thinking, well, why didn't Mark say that? Matthew did. Well, that's the whole point. Mark's got a different objective than Matthew does, as does Luke, as does John. And so that's why, you know, fill in the blanks, if you will. In fact, we talk about the synop synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which record similar, almost the same um, details, whereas I think it's 82% of John's material is unique to his gospel. And so why? Because he had a different objective, completely different objective than the other three. And, and it was written much later. So that I think that's important. It plays into the whole conversation here. I think another thing to note is I think there's been a lot of talk among secular uh, sects or popular culture of that because of the amount of time that was between them, things were forgotten or distorted. And then all the way down to here, the Bibles we have now are not uh, reliable anymore. But for any of you that know anything about um, Qumran, you would know that 
that was one of the greatest discoveries we had in the 20th century. So 20th century being 1900s for those of you that get confused by that 20th century is <laughs> 1900s. Um, you had the discovery of the Qumran scrolls. What happened was a shepherd went into a cave, was frustrated that he couldn't find his like sheep, threw a rock, broke a clay pot, ended up finding the scroll. And he's like, hey, I'm going to make some sandals out of these. Like this is good <laughs> animal skin. And so he sends it to this guy to have it tanned and like get it turned into sandals. And he recognizes some of the print. And he's like, wait a second, this is old and this looks important. And so he had a friend that was connected Turned out to be a scroll, I think, out of possibly, I think it was Isaiah, maybe, is the one that they found. And right, that's so they're, they're, yeah, they found one of Isaiah, yeah, but they I don't found know if that tons. was the one. Um, I don't remember exactly which one they had first, but they ended up going back. He's like, hey, if you find any of these, let me know. Well, it ended up causing a whole excavation to happen. And during that excavation, they found every single book of the Bible except for Esther. Right. And so, and when they translated them and looked over them, it wasn't like it was 50%, 60%, 70, 80, or 90. It was 99, I believe, was the percent accuracy. And the issues were only with occasional articles of either excluding or including based on style, or like how you would say a sentence versus how I would say a sentence. Right. But it was like 99% accurate or 98% accurate. And all the like entire stories and context and everything were intact and perfect and that was thousands of years separated so you have a Qumran community that's there only a couple hundred years after everything having all these scriptures being passed back and forth copied like studied day in and day out and they're intact and we have our modern translation and you can look back at them and they'd be no more different than reading like the new king james version versus an NIV version versus an NASB, it'd actually be more accurate to the actual original language we had. Yeah, and for those who don't know the Qumran scrolls, that's the Dead Sea Scrolls in 1947, greatest archaeological find of the 20th century by far. And what was significant about the copy of Isaiah, and the reason you probably thought of that one is because it's probably the most significant find. We found all the books of the Bible, as you said, of the old, now this is all Old Testament. Um, and by the way, this is a Coptic Christians um, that, that have these scrolls. Uh, that were faithful followers of Christ, but they were the Old Testament scrolls. And so the copy they found of Isaiah, what was significant about that is it was a thousand years older than the oldest copies of the Mesoretic text we had. Now, for those who don't know, and this this all is good, so even though we're taking our time and going slow, it's beneficial because, again, why are there scholars today that are more persuaded than ever that our Bible is reliable? Any serious biblical scholar is persuaded of that. Why? Because, again, here's a, here's a copy of Isaiah, a thousand years older than the oldest Mesoretic text we have, and it agrees perfectly with what we have. Now, like you said, minor variants, very minor, um, but, but, you know, significantly. The Bible we have today, it is estimated, is 99.6% accurate to the original autographs. That means the original copies penned by the authors themselves. That's particularly the New, New Testament, but the Old Testament as well. 99.6 uh, accuracy percent accuracy in the New Testament and the Old Testament follows to be equally accurate. And so, yeah, we're, we're talking about now the field of textual criticism, which is a good thing to bring up now because you and I believe that the content of the Bible is reliable. But the question that most people, as you alluded to, want to want to argue is, yeah, but how do we even know the Bible we have is the Bible the authors wrote? In other words, okay, let's say Moses did write the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How do we know that what he wrote is similar to what we have today? And the argument is kind of like, what do they call it, telephone, where uh, one kid will pass a secret to the next kid, and by the time he goes around the room, yeah. it's something completely different. Same thing with a fish story, right? I caught it, it was this big, and you know, as it goes down through the generations, that fish becomes you know, the whale that um, King Ahab, or not King Ahab, a uh, Captain Ahab or whatever was trying to kill in Moby Dick or whatever. So the point is that these things can become corrupted over time, and that's true. So that's why we need to ask and answer the question, how do we know the Bible we have today is reliable? And that comes down, Cameron, to a science known as textual criticism. This is not textual criticism like a movie critic critiquing a movie. Oh, I like the action, but the acting was poor or the plot was bad. No, this is a scientific endeavor by which we analyze all ancient documents to determine their veracity, their validity. Are they really, you know, documents from a given author? 
Are they really from that time period? Are they a reliable copy of the original auto? When we say autographs, we don't mean an autograph like a movie star giving you an autograph. An autograph is the original copy that say Paul or Peter or John would have written. We have none of those from any of the scriptures, right? Because they would have long since fallen apart, been lost or damaged or whatever. But we have thousands upon thousands of copies. So how do we know that they're reliable? And so let's just kind of crack this open, Cameron. I think I think we'll talk a little bit about this today and then come back, you know, and talk more about some other aspects of this next week. But I think it would be good to kind of at least breach the the uh, the lid, if you will, open up the lid on this a little bit. So let me let me just start off with this: is that when you're when you're dealing with textual criticism, to determine the authenticity of a copy of an ancient document, you want you want three things matter. Number one, the amount, the number of manuscripts that you have, the more the better, because then you can cross-check them with, with each other to see if they agree, right? So number one, the number of manuscripts you have. Number two, the level of agreement when comparing those manuscripts with each other. And then thirdly, how close are the copies that you have, how close were they made or written or copied in relation to the time of those original manuscripts? So in other words, if you have something that's copied thousands of years later, it's far more likely to be corrupted than something that was copied from the original autograph a week later, right? If it's a copy of a copy of a copy, then obviously there's more chance for corruption to find its way in. And so when it comes to this uh, science of textual criticism, it has long been well established that the New Testament comes out way ahead, way ahead of any other ancient document. Now, that's not believers, Christians saying that. That is what the field of textual criticism says. And so, Cameron, I think it'd only be fair maybe to give a couple of examples of other ancient documents, how many copies we have of them, how far they were copied after the originals, and then we'll kind of get into this. But let me just give a couple of examples. It was believed for a long time that we only had five manuscripts of Aristotle's work dated 1400 years from the events or 1400 years from the original writings now that's been updated more recently we actually have now a thousand manuscripts well, that's pretty good a thousand manuscripts dated 1200 years so that's a little bit closer from the events they were actually written originally around 384 to 322 bc so when you're going bc the smaller the number the the um closer it is to us um and 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 so that's, you know, not too far, 427 to 347 BC. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got the wrong one. 384 to 322 BC. The earliest copies we have of that, though, are in AD 850. So again, that's 1,200 years after the originals were written. And that's, you know, a thousand manuscripts. That's pretty good, but still 1,200 years. That, that's a long time for a lot of corruption. But you never hear a college professor saying, well, we don't really know if Aristotle wrote this. Because after all, the copies are so old, we only have a thousand of them. It's just given, right, that they did. Now, that's just one example. Let me just give you maybe one. I've got tons of these, but let me just give maybe one more so that we have kind of an idea. Caesar's firsthand account of the Gaelic Wars. Um, it was originally thought we had 10 manuscripts dated 1,000 years from the events. Now we have 251 dated 900 years, still, still a, a millennium almost from the events. They were written around. 10 to 44 BC, with the earliest copy dated 1080. So that's still a lot of time. I know you mentioned that you uh, only want to do one more. Do you happen to have uh, the information Iliad? on Alexander the Great uh, oh. on there? Let me, let me see if I do. I don't know if I have Alexander the Great. Um, I can't remember that one off the top of my head, but that one was always mind boggling to me, how little we actually had on him. Um, right. I found that one out, I think, from one of my Latin teachers that was telling me. Yeah, I don't have his work particularly, but there's a lot that follow this yeah. same idea, this same. Yeah, thing. Alexander the Great, pretty much all the information we had on him was written from, I think, I want to say it was Plutarch. And he was a, a historically unreliable historian yeah. who would corrupt and change details about his subjects based on whether or not he liked them. Right. And so in his like estimation, there are people that he made gay because he didn't like them. So he made them have like homosexual and tendency. And we have no idea if that's historically accurate or not. Right. And we had one historian and it was like hundreds of years after his death wrote the first thing about him. It was like 400 years, I think, after his death. Again, don't quote me on these numbers because I'm trying to remember something I learned back in college. But 
we took it as absolute fundamental. Like I remember learning so much about Alexander the Great, the one who swept across like what is right. now like modern Europe or ancient like Greece and all of that area was set on conquering the entire world. We have this much information on him that might not be reliable or accurate in any way, shape, form, or fashion. We kind of are just somewhat certain that he existed. We can't be a hundred percent sure if we if we took the same examination that we give towards historical biblical texts. Right. And and the interesting thing about that is very true. History is written by the winners. And so a lot of the kings were lionized to made to be larger than life, um, which is interesting because Jesus was never popular among ancient historians. He was always spoken about by friends of Rome, enemies of the church, like, for example, Tacitus and other uh, historians would have not been Christ followers for sure, and yet they acknowledge him. We have nine extra-biblical sources from ancient history that talk about the life of Jesus of Nazareth. So the fact that we know that he lived, died, was crucified is is beyond any question. No, no reliable biblical scholar, or I'm sorry, not biblical scholar, but no no reliable scholar of ancient documents denies that Jesus actually existed, lived, and was crucified in the time of Pontius Pilate. That has been historically verified. Now, you'll hear people that try to deny that, but that's kind of more, you know, you They're not taken seriously in the yeah, academic no. world. There's right. a uh, book called The Historic Fi uh, Historical Five Views of Jesus, something along those lines. If you ever want to like check it out, it gives you five different historians' accounts of uh, Jesus, and one of them says that he doesn't believe he ever existed. And like when it comes to, because they give their narrative, people, the uh, other uh, academics will give their positive views of what he said and their negatives. And the guy that doesn't believe it at all is just absolutely roasted and made fun of. And just like all of them say he's like out to lunch and has no idea what he's talking about to yeah. try and deny that he was a historical figure. So across all secular like academy and everything, even people there, I know uh, secular historians that try to um, uh, correct like Tacitus and say like, well, not all of that was accurate. Not all of it was like, did he actually say Christians came in and tried to like, like redo history. And, and then they'll still say, but Jesus did exist. He lived, he died. He like, he was in that time period. Absolutely. Like even when they're trying to correct it, there's, so much overwhelming evidence. Sorry, I didn't mean to jump in. Just had a. Well, that's great. That I'm, I'm glad you did because it, it it just lends more credibility to what we're saying here. The, let's talk about the New Testament and its runner-up. The runner-up is the Iliad by Homer, and we have more copies of that than we do any other ancient document. Um, at one time, I think it was. Um, let me see. Um, the history of the Trojan War, actually, Homer's Iliad. The history of the Trojan War had 900 manuscripts, dated 950. Uh, years from the events, updated now 1,757 manuscripts dated 400 years. So that's getting pretty close. Um, uh, the events were written around 800 BC with the earliest copies dated 400 BC. So that's that's getting very close. And nobody doubts that Homer's um, Iliad, the history of the Trojan War and all that, nobody doubts that he wrote that. That's pretty well established. But that's the closest we have to the New Testament. So let's, let's turn our attention to that. And um, we'll call, probably finish out talking about this aspect of it. The New Testament, the total count for early New Testament manuscripts available to us today is over 25,000, previously 24,000. Uh, Josh McDowell recently updated um, his book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and he has said that some have claimed recently that there are 66,000 with the advent of many discoveries and artifacts like mummy wrappings that contain biblical manuscript fragments and so forth and so on. The numbers include about 5,800 Greek manuscripts dated from 30 to 150 years from the events. That's a very small time window, way too small for legend to creep in from a historical perspective. So that means that the copies we have happened or were written within 30 to 150 years from the events. They were written, to talk about the New Testament here, 49 to 95 AD, with the earliest copies dated at 117. And a few that might be dated within the same century uh, as the authors themselves lived. Uh, again, we have uh, about 8,000 manuscripts in other languages like Armenian, Coptic, Gothic, Ethiopian, Syriac, Georgian, Slavic, dated early 2nd century and on, like 100 to 150 years after the events. And then we have 10,000 manuscripts in Latin, the Latin Vulgate, that were translated by Jerome. I think it was Jerome. 300 to 350 years after the events. 
Now, the Bible obviously is our primary source, the eyewitness of the events of Jesus, and so that's why it is so important that we have good evidence that these things are authentic. Um, the New Testament autographs were complete and in use by the end of the first century AD, um, and has surviving manuscripts and fragments dated within 25 to 150 years of the events. These copies were written and distributed far and wide over the known world at that time, which obviously that's why you make copies, right? Is so they could be distributed to different people. And that's why we have them in different languages so that they could be distributed to the people of those various uh, language groups. And so you would think with so many copies being written to so many dis disparate groups over a wide, you know, geographical range, that there would be a lot of variance, a lot of error in, you know, when comparing these manuscripts with each other, but there aren't. Now, somebody might be surprised when we say, well, yeah, there's like 30,000 variants between them. But those variants are things like spelling, commas. As you said, maybe the way a sentence is phrased, a word or two might be inverted just because of how they say it in one place versus another. But the manuscripts agree. In fact, less than 1% of all those manuscripts um, are in, under any competent dispute whatsoever. Most, like we said, are spelling, minor grammatical issues. Uh, the cool thing too, Cameron, is that the church fathers quoted the New Testament so many times that out of the 27 books of the Bible that we have in the New Testament, all of them were quoted by the church fathers, which were, of course, just one generation after the apostles, except for 11 verses. So we can recreate the New Testament just from the church fathers, let alone the 25,000 copies of the New Testament we have in various languages, including, you know, the the, the five, or I'm sorry, the 8,000, 8,000, 8,000 that we have, not 8,000, how many, in, the, in just the Greek translation, 5,800, I'm sorry, 5,800 copies in just the Greek alone. Now, people will say, well, yeah, who decided the Bible is the Bible, right? That's something that is commonly brought up. Well, yeah, you know, Constantine just decided that you know, you guys figure out what's the Bible. Well, that's not true. Uh, in 393 AD, there was a synod. A synod is like a conference, if you will, a convention of scholars. It was called the Synod of Hippo, listed the 27 books of the New Testament, which were already regarded as authentic and authoritative. So a lot of people think that they put all these books out there and said, let's, oh, I like this one, I like this one, and here's the 27 books of the New Testament. That's not how it went. By this time, by 400 years in, it was already well-established and known what gospels, what letters were written authentically by apostles. There were a few that they spent a little extra time looking at. I think Third John, Jude, a couple like that, that they, Philemon, I think was one, that they kept, you know, a little bit, had a little bit more scrutiny looking at, but they were included because they had often, um, they were authentic. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of people have talked about some of these extra biblical books, like the Epistle of Barnabas and so forth, but these books were clearly known at the time to be spurious, to be, you know, trying to push an agenda, maybe a Gnostic agenda or something else, and, and were pretty well established as frauds. Um, we would say extra-biblical, non-canonical, but they're frauds, um, and so they were not included in the canon. But it was already well established and known, so all they did was really kind of put the official seal on what was pretty well already established, Cameron, as the, um, as the authoritative New Testament. Yeah, and for those of you who are wondering, like, didn't you start off talking about like financial stuff and like <laughs> about what was going on in your personal life and yeah. what was going on around you and other people like having trouble trusting God? Like, why have you gotten into this subject? Well, again, we said we're going to foundations of faith. And so before we start talking and trying to preach out of the Bible, and we want to first assure you that, like I said, seeing streamers and other people in popular culture and even ministers we've seen or worship leaders, I mean, it became vogue at one point almost for like former worship leaders to come out and say like, I now renounce my faith. And I was like, okay, yeah, like I care what you say. I um, mean, yeah. but a lot of people took it very personally and were like, I can't believe he lost his faith. What do I do? Well, you keep trusting in God. Well, why? Like, why? Because the church says so? No, let's look at it from a secular perspective. Let's look at it from a historical perspective. For those of you who don't know, my major in college was history, was studying historical documents. And one of the reasons I love studying American history was because it was so recent and so reliable because we had so many sources. But still, even that, the amount of sources we have from a lot of events and instances don't compare. They pale in comparison to what the Bible has. No. It's historical validity and veracity and consistency is just something that 
is divine, uh, like in my opinion, uh, divinely ordained. And because there's no other way that you can have something stand the test of time. This, I mean, we looked at it from even secular. The next best thing was the uh, Trojan War. And it still, it's tens of thousands of way from being anywhere close to what the Bible offers. And we have so many Christian forefathers and different individuals establishing the faith and saying, hey, no, this Bible or this part isn't accurate, but this is, and this is what we will keep. And generation after generation of generation of devout Christians upholding this tradition, it's not people just being like, ah, I want to slip something in. No, because we can still compare to the original manuscripts and see that our scripture is intact. And so, yeah, we didn't get into maybe more the spiritual side of things this uh, episode, and we probably will get into it next time. But the reason we wanted to take so much time to lay this down is because when we start getting into scriptural backing for it, when we start getting into, like, for example, Deuteronomy 7, verse 9 says, therefore, know that the Lord, your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generation to those who love him and keep his commandments. When we read that, and we're starting to talk about how you can trust God because he established these covenants and he fulfilled them. And it's like, well, who said he's fulfilled them? Who's to say that what you actually read is reliable and what you're saying is reliable? Well, history is to say that. Secular historians are to say that what we have said, what we have read is consistent. The Old Testament was meticulously put together and had to have different qualifications for it to stand the test of time. I mean, the book of Maccabees isn't in the Old Testament. Is it something that's inaccurate or far-fetched? No. The book of 1 Maccabees, I would say, is mostly a historical account, but it didn't have any apostolic authority. It didn't have, or I guess I shouldn't say apostolic authority for Old Testament, but the right. uh, the um, oh, what council was it that did the um, Hippo? Old Testament? Oh, I don't know Old the Testament? Old Testament. I don't know. Uh, I'm not. I'm gonna blank on it. My history professor, or my religion professor in college, is gonna be so disappointed if he ever sees this. Um, <laughs> but the Old Testament was carefully curated by, and they had to have certain qualifications. And when it didn't meet up to that, it got kicked out. So while the Book of First Maccabees, now second, third, fourth, they get a little. I think it's fourth. I don't know if it only goes to third. The other ones they end up kind of having an agenda because of like um the high priest role and the uh, king role getting combined and like it was just a bad idea for israel and it was never supposed to happen uh and so you see a lot more propaganda written in those but the book of first maccabees is historical why didn't it get included so many people are like why didn't it get included it just tells the story of what hanukkah is like what's wrong with it well it didn't have the same authority as the other ones did it didn't have the same reliability so instead of possibly jeopardize what they know to be scripture it wasn't included Old Testament, New Testament, incredibly well documented. And historically, we can look back and still see that today with all the different manuscripts from Old to New Testament, we can say, hey, we know that this is reliable. Some people, you and I were talking about this earlier, want to discount Daniel because Daniel was freakishly accurate. Um, When I just went on my trip to Israel, uh, one of the ministers that went on the trip, Josh Hershey, uh, son of the friend of yours, Keith Hershey, him and I were talking about how like people wanted to disprove Daniel because it was just, it's crazy how accurate Daniel nailed yeah. things. And because of that, secular historians want to be like, well, obviously Daniel was written way, way later. But the issue is, and as you and I were talking about, Daniel's in the Septuagint, which they wouldn't have just randomly thrown in Daniel like, oh, here's a new coming book. Let's just throw it in real quick and tuck it in and like hide it in there and let's see if it passes. No, it would have been something that they said, hey, We know that this is a reliable document and has been for a long, long, long time. And so that's why it's getting brought into the Septuagint. They wouldn't have just done it last minute haphazardly just to try and fool historians thousands of years later. It makes absolutely no sense. And so, yes, we're going through a lot of this. And a lot of it is a lot of academic information and not uh, we're not reading a lot of scripture, but we want to first provide absolute confidence to anyone listening that's like, why should I trust the Bible? Well, this is why. Yeah. It's been historically and meticulously curated and is, like you said earlier, so beautifully written from beginning to middle to end where scripture is referenced across the entire thing back and forth a million times. And it's just the most it would have been impossible for man to have done it by themselves, uninspired by God. 
Yeah, and let me just read this quote. This is from Sir, uh, Sir Frederick Kenyon, director and principal librarian of the British Museum. He's an expert on ancient manuscripts. And when he says librarian, it doesn't mean he's one who, you know, makes you pay for your late library books. It means he's a, a, a professor or a expert on ancient documents. This is what he said. The interval between the dates of the original composition, that's the autographs, of the New Testament and the earliest extant evidence, that means the earliest copies, become so small, they're so written cl so close together, as to be in fact negligible. And the foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to as substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as firmly established. And as you said, Cameron, the, and, and for those who don't know about the Septuagint, Cameron mentioned that the book of Daniel was included in that. The, the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures written because the whole world had become Hellenized and everyone was speaking Greek. Many of the Jews didn't even speak Hebrew anymore. They'd gone into captivity in Babylon, came out speaking Aramaic, which was kind of a corruption of Hebrew, I think, kind of a mixture. So they're not even speaking Hebrew. They want something in the language of the day would be like translate it into American, if you will, or English. And so they they have 70 scholars, which is what Septuagint means. It's just a Greek word for 70. And they have 70 scholars in 270 AD translate the Masoretic text, the, the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Well, for Daniel to be included in that, which they were saying it was translated much later, well, it would have already had to have been established, well established, um, by historians as a legitimate Old Testament book where it had never been included. They would have considered it spurious, just like the Epistle of Barnabas was considered spurious. And that was, you know, the Daniel book of Daniel, um, in eerie detail, as you said, Cameron, describes interactions between um, the Ptolemaic Empire and the Seleucid Empire, which were two branches of Alexander the Great's broken up Greece, to such exquisite degree that you can literally, Dake's commentary does a great job of this, where it'll have a scripture, and then it'll show the historical thing where that was fulfilled. The scripture, historical, history, and it's literally like a blow-by-blow, blow, like watching a football game, an announcer saying, this is what the scripture said, this is what happened on the field, this is what the scripture said, this is what happened in the game. It's amazing how precisely accurate, even to the point where Daniel gives the day in which Jesus would ride in victoriously into Jerusalem, announcing himself as the Messiah. It's it's creepy accurate, and that's why historians who don't believe in the Bible. But here's another here's another good reason to believe in the Old Testament. Jesus validated it all. The Bible said that on his seven mile walk to Emmaus after his resurrection, he gave a Bible study to those two downhearted disciples who had witnessed his crucifixion. It says, beginning at Moses and going through all the prophets, he testified of the scriptures which testify, or he explained the scriptures which testified of himself. And so he, he in one stroke, he validates the whole Old Testament, but he also quoted from Daniel and said, as Daniel says. So like one person said, if you believe in Jesus, then you have no problem with who the author of Daniel is. If you don't believe in Jesus, you have a lot bigger problems than who the author of Daniel is. <laughs> Daniel is. So, you know, the fact of the matter is we have good historical, we didn't even talk about archaeology. It's, a, it's an amazing thing that one of the premier archaeologists of history has said there has never been an archaeological find that has ever contradicted the Bible. That's a huge statement for a secular archaeologist to make, and yet it's true, and yet constantly finds are being made to confirm um, you know, the his, historicity of the Bible. So yeah, there's a lot here, Cameron, and we can't touch on it today, but as you said, if we're going to be talking about trusting God, and if the Bible is the foundation of our trust, then we have to validate its integrity or else we're building air castles in the sky. And so we really have to have a firm foundation for our faith, hence foundations for faith. Yeah, and uh, for the, many of you know, I was just in Israel for a couple of weeks. And one of the things that I was just uh, still amazed at when I went there, because there are a lot of things that I was amazed at in a negative way, but one of the things in a positive way was we went to so many sites and when talking to the tour guide, they're like, he's like, yeah, they're still finding things every day. Yeah. This <laughs> site's still active. Yeah. This site still has like one of the sites they're like excavating what would have been old Jerusalem or like ancient Jerusalem where David's palace would have been like we were there and they were still excavating and doing work. Like while we're taking the tour and he's like, the, one of the tour ladies was, uh, wasn't our main tour guide, but someone he had brought in, he was, she was saying how, if you turned around and looked there, you would see where um, David would have looked over the kingdom and probably saw where Bathsheba was. And wow. it's 
being actively excavated. And it's going to be one of the largest excavations in history, costing the most money. But because there's so much and it's in the middle of an active city, like there's a lot of work that they have to dig underneath everything and keep those houses safe and everything. But every single day, every single day, they are coming out with more evidence that backs what the Bible has said already. And what we've known for thousands of years for those who have been Christian but this world is starting to realize slowly and slowly that it is not a story. It is fact. It is history. Yeah. And I mean, even uh, our tour, I was talking about how right before COVID happened, they had just had another like archaeological dig that was mind blowing. And because he worked with the government, he ended up like coming across the uh, uh, he had to like call these people and check on them, see if they're OK and everything. Because um, he had in Israel, for those, of you know, you have to do mandatory conscription for so many years and he did his service and was like in the equivalent of the Navy SEALs and everything. But during COVID, he like helped them out and was working with them still and doing some stuff for like the health uh, like board there, which would have been like our who, but they're like version. Um, and so he was calling people and he's like, I recognize the guy. He had just done the dig and I was a tour guide. And he's like, I'm not supposed to do this, but I mean, if the, he doesn't tell, I won't tell. And he called up the guy and he's like, Hey, I just want to check. Like, you're okay, right? I can lock you off the list. He's like, Yeah. He's like, Okay. I don't know if you're bored at home, like I'm bored at home, but I saw that you just started this dig right before COVID happened. And he went on and talked to him for like three hours at just nonstop of all the new things that they're finding out that they still haven't published. It'll probably be published in the next year or two. Just dozens of accounts from the Bible that are being validated still today. And every single day, we see more and more. So as you mentioned, like there's not been a single archaeological find that has discredited the Bible, but dozens are being found out a year, every year, yeah. if not more. Yeah. And another thing too, it, I, I mean, the whole thing is so expansive. We can't get into all of it, but I want to recommend a book. Um, I, when I was teaching apologetics, I originally recommended we use a book by William Lane Craig, which I still regret to this day, simply because as a Christian philosopher, as brilliant as he is, if you're not initiated in that world, it's very complex and very difficult. It's deep, deep, deep weeds to try to wade through. So if I were to do that class again, um, which I'm not teaching it this year, I don't know who is, I taught it last year, but um, I would choose Eric Metaxas's new book called Is Atheism Dead? It is the best book on apologetics, in my opinion, written on a popular level. Now, if you want to get again into the weeds with the William Lane Craig's and some of these others, that's great. But he just simply synthesizes a lot of the data you're ready to get from those kinds of people and puts it on a popular level. I love the book. I've read it and listen, really audiobook, listen to it many, many times. But if you want to know more proofs about the existence of God, as well as, you know, biblical integrity, as well as historical stuff, um, he even goes into how we discovered that the Hittites were really real um, and all this kind of stuff that they had thought these are just you know, literary in inventions by the writers of the Bible, even David himself was um, considered to be a fictitious character until recently. And I think it's um, Tell Dan, they found the inscription, House of David, um, I Hezekiah, got to see that. Isaiah. What's that? I got to see that stone. It's really? actually in the Israel Museum. And our uh, tour guide was talking about it. But yeah, you can see, and it talks about how a, uh, in Tell Dan, they found this block and the guy's bragging about that he killed uh, uh, one of the kings of the line of David. Yeah, how awesome. So, you know, folks, if you want to know, I mean, if people are honestly intellectually curious, th the information is there. Now, if you're just wanting to back your na narrative and say, well, I don't believe in the Bible because I don't want to believe in the Bible, because again, it's going to require a certain maybe moral responsibilities for me. That's a different thing altogether. But for the honest, intellectually curious individual, the, the information is ample. And we've been teaching on this for years in uh, biblical apologetics at Summit Bible College. I've been, you know, a study, a student of biblical apologetics for at least a, a decade or more. And there's been a primary focus of my life in more recent years. But, you know, the information is there. And the great thing about today, Cameron, is it's accessible to everybody. And for the most part, on a popular level, just start Googling stuff. And, um, you know, you'll run into some good information. Now, there's always detractors. And that's okay. There's always room for dialogue. But just do a little bit of research on your own. Read that book by Eric Metaxas, Is Atheism Dead? And at least ask yourself, is there not a compelling case? And I think you'll find that there is. Well, I think for this time uh, on Foundations of Faith, that'll be uh, enough yeah. since we've uh, given a lot of information. Yep. Next week, we'll probably get into, and uh, as we were talking about before this uh, podcast started, there's kind of different uh, camps that 
this conversation falls into. There's our personal story with trusting in God. There's scriptural story for trusting in God. And then there's a lot of apologetic reason to trust in God. Today, we had a lot more on the apologetic and the scientific, the historical, I guess not really scientific, well, somewhat scientific. Textual criticism has yeah. been evolved out of scientific methods. And, yeah, um, but a lot more apologetic stuff. And probably next week, we'll get into more either personal or scriptural sides, or maybe hit a little more uh, apologetic things. But I think for now, I'll close us in prayer. Sounds good. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who is trustworthy and that you haven't hidden yourself. You haven't tried to make yourself hard to find, but instead you've left a whole world to be discovered. You have given us the beauty of searching out these beautiful treasures of history, of mighty men of faith who have come before us. We thank you that you have inspired people to leave so many manuscripts and copies and documents behind for us to trace back and just see your faithfulness, that you are a God that is trustworthy, that you've never done something in secret. When you made the Old uh, Testament Ten Commandments, you proclaimed it out loud. When Jesus came and declared a new covenant, you proclaimed it out loud. And we thank you that you're still proclaiming the truth of who you are. We thank you that if anyone is out there searching for you, God, that if they're looking to find the truth of you, that you just make yourself clear and known to them, and that you give us the opportunity to come across these people and share the gospel with them, to share the truth of what we have learned with them, that you give us the opportunity to go out and be laborers for you. We thank you, Lord, that you're continuing to draw us closer towards you and building us up. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks everyone for joining us. We hope this was enlightening. You may want to give it another listen to, share it with a friend, and then comment. You know, let us know how you're feeling about these talks. If there's something you're really wanting to hear, let us know. Private message us, put it in the comments. But thanks for joining us today, and we will see you again next week. Bye-bye.